call the meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. of the United States of America, and to the Republic for stance, one nation, under God, visible, and deemed justice for all. Okay. Any changes to the agenda? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is, uh, do we have any more guests on? We have C. Jean's on. Jean Merger. Yes. Yeah. And we have Andy Grice and Matt Mayer from the auditor's office. So, Tom, can you quickly run through the protocols? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, the city has determined that it is not practical or prudent to conduct an in person city council meeting due to the local state of emergency and social distancing guidelines. Accordingly, this meeting will be held electronically and conducted under Minnesota State Statute Section 13D.021. To the extent practical, members of the public may attend the meeting by utilizing the published link for call-in information. A couple items for protocol. Uh, we would like that everybody stay muted until there's a public comment section um, or you're requested to speak or called upon by the mayor or a public hearing is open. City Council will not be muted. The whole school specifically, and that's me, uh, specifically solicit questions or comments from the public at various points during each item. Please hold questions and comments till requested. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand virtually and I'll go through how to do that. Um, and then staff will individually recognize those wishing to speak on behalf of the mayor. Um, if you're not being recognized, provide an obvious visual indicator such as raising your hand or waving at the camera. Uh, your microphone will be reviewed after you've spoken. And all votes, uh, given the nature of the meeting, need to be by roll call. So if you're participating on your computer or laptop, at the bottom of your screen, there'll be a section that says participants. If you click on that, it'll open up a sidebar on the right-hand side. You simply need to click raise hand. That will make me aware that you're looking to speak. Um, if you're participating on your uh, handheld device, uh, if you click on more, the three little buttons in the lower right-hand corner, it'll also have a raise hand section. And again, if I do miss that you are raising your hand virtually, um, given that we have a limited number of people in the audience tonight, uh, just unmute yourself, I think, for tonight. Let me know that you're out there, you want to speak, or just make a visual cue. If you're on your phone, uh, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand, and staff will call in, on individual telephone numbers and ask that you address the council. If you are participating by phone after the council is heard from participants online that you wish to speak, the mayor will ask for comments from individuals. So we'll go through people that are working on electronic devices and then we'll specifically ask if anybody on phone wants to participate. I should note that on the agenda tonight, we do not have any public hearing or public comment items. That doesn't mean that if you want to um, address the council under public comment, which you cannot do so, we'll provide that opportunity. Thanks, Tom. Uh, at the end of this one, changes to the agenda. Anyone like to make motion a motion? Motion to approve agenda. Motion by Timmerman. Second. Second by Novak. Uh, going to roll call. Councilmember Seekersad. Yes. Nice. Uh, Aye. Josh. Aye. 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 I vote aye as well. Jenny passes. <laughs> So on to presentations, proclamations that we have uh, an audit of our 2019 fiscal year. So Mr. Mayor, uh, this evening we have um, Andy Grice and Matt Meyer from uh, from KV, the city's auditing firm. Um, Matt uh, has been with us for a long time, as has been um, Andy. I'll have them get their backgrounds and, and overview, but. Uh, this is primarily a verbal presentation, but do you guys have a presentation that you would like to give or you need to share a screen? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'm here uh, with Brooke and KDV. Um, Andy will be making the presentation this evening, and I want to introduce Andy formally to the council. Um, Andy is uh, new to the council members, but not new to the city. Andy has managed the job. Uh, 
of the audit for the last uh, five or six years and uh, knows the city very well. He was recently promoted to shareholder or partner with the firm and he will be my successor in the years to come here. Uh, Andy and I will work together on the audit the next couple of years to make sure it's a smooth transition as I work toward my retirement. But I wanted to introduce Andy here a couple of years ahead of time so you know him as a familiar face, someone that you can rely on just as you rely on me over the years. And he'll be making the presentation tonight to give you some perspective on the results of the 2019 fiscal audit, as well as some financial analysis of your general fund and your enterprise funds for the year. So I'll turn it over to Andy. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council for having me here tonight. I uh, wanted to start off the presentation talking about uh, the responsibilities uh, of, us, of us as your auditor, and then also the responsibilities of management in regards to our independent auditor's reports. It is management's responsibility uh, to prepare the financial statement. It includes cutting checks, making payroll, processing your utility bills, and all recording all of that financial data onto your general ledger. And it's our job to come in and test and examine the information that supports those numbers and ultimately give an opinion on the financial statements. When it comes to that opinion, we are happy to report that we are issuing an unmodified opinion or a clean opinion, which is the best that we can give as your auditor. And what that does is provides evidence that the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects. We also issue our report in accordance with government auditing standards. Uh, this report talks about our consideration of internal control, and we did have two internal control findings to report this year. One being the lack of segregation of accounting duties, uh, a, a comment that's been present in the past, and then also material audit adjustments. When we make an adjustment to the city's books uh, that's material, we ha also have to recognize that as an internal control finding. We also requ are required to report on the results of uh, our testing of municipal compliance and happy to report that there were no findings to report. And we also issue a communications letter that has our required communication and our financial analysis. To start the financial analysis, I also wanted to talk about the city council's role in regards to the financial statements and that's establishing the, the budget. And when it comes to the general fund budget for 2019, city council anticipated $2.3 million in revenue, expenditures of $2 million, transfers out to other funds of $197,000, and expected an increase in fund balance of $50,000. When it comes to actual results, revenue came in at $2,370,000, uh, which was $80,000 more than anticipated. Expenditures came in at uh, just under $2 million or $106,000 less than anticipated, which resulted in revenue exceeding expenditures by $433,000. Transfers out to uh, capital funds amounted to $539,000 due to having a surplus there and also uh, excess fund balance uh, in excess of the city's uh, minimum fund balance policy and had a decrease in fund balance in the general fund of $107,000. When it comes, to, it comes to revenues in the general funds, this next chart shows uh, the makeup of those revenues. And in total, uh, revenues increased $110,000 or about 5%. And the majority of the increase here in 2019 relates to taxes and, uh, taxes and assessments, which increased about $124,000 or 7.5%. And that was due to an increase in the amount levied in 2019. This was offset by a decrease in intergovernmental revenues of $31,000 due to uh, no longer receiving the assistance grants. Uh, remaining categories remain consistent with the prior year. When it comes to the budget for uh, revenues, uh, in total, as we saw earlier, uh, we had a variance here of about $80,000 or 3.5% coming in better than anticipated. And most variances were uh, fairly consistent with uh, budgeted amounts except for licenses and permits had a variance of about $30,000 uh, over budget due to conservative bud budgeting. Total expenditures for 2019 increased um, $49,000. Uh, public safety expenditures increased $73,000 due to some additional salaries and benefits. 
general government expenditures decreased $63,000 due to less, uh, less engineering, accounting, and consulting fees. And the remaining uh, allocation of these are consistent with the prior year. When it comes to the general fund budget to actual results for expenditures, uh, there was a total of um, $1,932,000 uh, $1, compared to just over a $2 million budget. So coming in $106,000 less than anticipated. And the most significant variance, again, occurred in general government where the expenditures were $94,000 less than anticipated. Again, related to engineering, accounting, and consulting fees being lower than anticipated. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to, interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. The audio is kind of cutting out a little bit. I'm not sure if there's a microphone issue. Um, I'm using the computer audio, so let me <laughs> do there. Uh, going on to general fund balance, uh, this chart shows the last five years of the general fund balance. Uh, general fund balance decreased here in 2019, going from uh, just under 1.5 million uh, to $1,374,000, which is a decrease of about $107,000 or 7.2% here in 2019. Uh, the general fund balance at the end of the year represented 71% uh, uh, of the general fund expenditures for the year. It is the city's policy to maintain 50% at, at a minimum of the operating. Uh, Next, uh, we're taking a look at the water fund operating and revenues for two, uh, the last five years. In 2019, operating revenues uh, and expenses were fairly consistent. Uh, expenses decreased at about 5%, and that was due to um, costs uh, being lower than the prior year. The overall operations uh, resulted in a um, operating income here of $381,000, which was an increase from the prior year. We also provide this information without depreciation. Depreciation is a non-cash expense on the books. And after factoring that out, there was positive operations of $815,000. Also some significant non-operating items occurring in the, in the water fund, uh, special assessments, and ultimately uh, resulted in change in that position, uh, increasing that position by about $460,000. At the end of the year, the water fund had an unrestricted fund balance unrestricted net position of about 7.1 million with the unrestricted portion being about four hundred and forty thousand dollars next we'll take a look at the sewer fund operations for the last five years uh, operating revenues and operating expenses were fairly consistent with the prior year resulting in an operating deficit of two hundred and fifty five thousand dollars in factoring out depreciation had an operating deficit of, of about seven thousand dollars this fund does have um, negative cash at the end of the year. Uh, did have a positive total fund balance of $5.3 million. A majority of that is uh, in, invested in capital assets, net of, net of related debt, and uh, at a negative uh, unrestricted net position at the end of the year. We, we would recommend that City Council continue to monitor this fund uh, to ensure that operations are covering the fund needs. Last, we'll take a look at the Storm Sewer Fund uh, for the past five years here. And in 2019, operating revenues increased just 1.2% or about $14,000 as expenses decreased uh, just 0.1%, fairly consistent with the prior year, resulting in operating income of $978,000, factoring out depreciation uh, coming in with a surplus of about $101,000. In this fund, there is positive unrestricted net position of $301,000. That's a summary of the 2019 operating results uh, for the audit and wanted to open it up for any questions. Thank you, Andy. Who has questions? Eight less written down, right? <laughs> no, I'm still just trying to. <laughs> No, I don't. I, as of right now, I do not have. John, I don't have any either. So, 
Was there anything that the council found surprising in the audit? No, I mean, the, the findings are pretty consistent from what we're finding year to year, just due to the internal controls and the limited number of staff that we have. Uh, yeah, budgetary is, I think, city staff always does a really good job of keeping us, or keeping us within and generally under budget and allowing us to sweep funds to other areas. So there's really no surprises here to me. So. And I think the items where you see weaknesses within our finances are no surprise. We talk about them regularly. It's planning reserves, especially in the sewer fund and the 318. Um, yeah. and, that, and that shows in the financial statements. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the presentation and for the audit. Thank you for, so much for having us. See you next year. Enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. Thank you, you guys. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to public comment. Is there anyone on that would like to speak under public comment? Um, Commissioner Wolf, are you on? Take that as no. I guess uh, this is uh, not trying to, to prompt public comment, but would Gene have any uh, public comment of how these Zoom meetings have gone? Uh, any feedback or criticism or anything? And you don't have to answer or want to be put on the spot either if you don't want to. You just, you're going to get Gene to not. I'll let you hear Gene. Oh. second. Nope, it's not letting me unmute you, Gene. There you go. I, now can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I've been observing these meetings to learn things. <laughs> I think you guys are doing a great job. I think at times it's probably a thankless job, but overall, considering, I think you're doing a great job. The best and uh, I'm not running for office. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Before you before you unmute, anything related to to this format at all? I mean, would you otherwise uh, be showing up in person if if they were if they were available that way? I'm just curious, you know, how the how the remote meetings have worked for you. And if, well, I mean, this is very convenient. Uh, the bad thing about your meetings is past my bedtime. Here I am. I appreciate it, Gene. Thank you. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, you bet. We'll, we'll, we'll talk again. You know. <laughs> I guess I'm the one that's got a mute. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, you no one else uh, for public comment. We'll go ahead and close that. Move on to consent. Oh, no, no. No, no. There's oh, Tom. Is that, is that Tom? Hi, Tom Wolf. You joined yeah, us? I, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm a. Uh, I'm in Minneapolis. I'm at a ball game, or if you can see me, but oh, can, can, uh, can, can you hear me? Your way and we can hear you. Now. Curious, so. Yeah, fire away. Yeah. Hey, just a couple things. You know, the CDA has it in the budget for uh, um, you know putting in the, those improvements on uh, two out to uh, thirty-five. So we're going to be looking for that. Uh, I'm hoping that blood drive is still on. Uh, the roundabout is a little bit behind schedule from what the highway department has told me. Um, we're still trying to get a lot of things open there at the uh, uh, county. Um, and, and one big hot issue right now is the, uh, the Renaissance Festival. Uh, the uh, owner came to our board meeting on uh, Tuesday to hopefully get support to open. And we all thought that was a good idea. And then we got a couple emails saying um, it's a bad idea. So anyhow, we're, it's uh, going to be more of a state health department thing. But, uh, you know, it brings a lot of money into the county and employs a lot of people. And so it's... Uh, um, it's nice if that thing can get going, but that's, you know, we'll have to see what the state health department says. But that's, uh, that's all I have, unless there's some questions. Tom, how far behind on, on the roundabout? I, I thought she said uh, like a week, a couple days to a week, Lisa told me. So yeah. uh, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping with this nicer weather here, I'm hoping they can pick things up and uh, get it moving quicker again. So we're yep. all with you, man. Yeah, I, I <laughs> the sooner the better, right? <laughs> so, you know, and the nice thing is that roundabout over in Prior Lake is uh, is open now. And uh, knock on wood, to my knowledge, there has not been an accident there. And uh, you know, when they opened that one up in Lakeville by uh, just past Target, 
I think the first week there was nearly a hundred or something. I don't know, but um, so it sounds like people have kind of learned and uh, figured them out. So that's a good thing. We're Scott County. We can handle our roundabouts. We can. We got it figured out here. So good deal. Hey, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Bye. Okay. Uh, so on the consent agenda, anyone any items on here they'd like to see pulled or or discussed a little bit more? And if not, uh, if someone wanted to make a motion, motion that would be a motion by Novak. Second. Uh, Timmerman Beach, okay, or. <laughs> I was trying to be loud enough for you guys to hear me, and my internet keeps going in and out. Don, why don't you go ahead and vote first? Second, or I, sorry, I. <laughs> Kate? I. Amanda? I. Josh? I. Vote I as well. Agenda, uh, consent agenda passes. So. We have no public hearings tonight. We don't have any general business, so we'll move on to reports. Uh, a couple items uh, under administration. One, the usual discussion re um, regarding public meeting format, and I think that really has a big influence by item number four, which is governor's executive order, uh, the mask mandate, as I affectionately refer to it. Um, so we've been continuing in a virtual meeting format for all of our public meetings going forward. Um, I don't think that there's anything at this point that would be staff to recommend doing differently. However, we have had council um, provide the opportunity for council members to actually participate from City Hall just because being able to make eye contact makes it easier for meeting flow, et cetera. Um, however, if we're moving with the new executive order, that would mean that if we're all in the same room, effective starting Sunday, we would all have to be wearing masks while we're doing that which will create issues, I think, with muffling and, and, and hearing. So what I'd like to throw out for the council is whether or not we need to go back to everybody remoting from their own residences or their remote locations rather than providing the opportunity to come to City Hall. I think we have to, just so people can understand us and hear us. I would agree. Makes the most sense. I, I agree with Kate. At first, when this whole thing started, I wanted to get back to normal, but I'm seeing it's happening too quick. I agree. I think we... I'm, I'm glad we did get back to some form of normalcy, but yeah, it's probably the prudent thing to go back to the Zoom meetings. So, so Josh, we may never see you again. <laughs> I mean, That's can... okay with me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of okay with us, too. <laughs> All right. Um, I second that. <laughs> Kidding. So the next item is a discussion regarding the reduction of license fees for on-sale liquor licenses renewals. Those are coming up. Um, Linda, our deputy clerk, has already sent out notices for that. Renewals basically run from October 1st through September, excuse me, November 1st through October 31st um, on an annual basis. Um, with the COVID impact and knowing that establishments which often have liquor licenses were some of those that were most impacted by the shutdown. A lot of cities have talked about whether or not they wanted to prorate, reduce, or eliminate um, those on-sale uh, liquor license fees for their upcoming renewals. I advised the council in the past that I plan to bring it forward. We're at that point in the process. So really we're just looking for direction from council. If the council wants to reduce the fees this year in any way, we would simply be amending the current year's fee schedule just for this year, and that would be on consent agenda at the next available council meeting, and we'd advise the applicants of that intended change in fee structure. Um, there's no magic to this. It's just a question of if it's, the council feels it's appropriate and to what degree, and provided information in the packet related to the impact that the council was to waive the entire um, on-sale liquor licenses for all businesses that apply to the maximum budget impact would be $18,000. Uh, we do budget for contingency and those types of things within a modest contingency within the budget. We're also doing very well relative to the budget so far through the year, so I think we have the capacity to absorb it if the council chose to do so. I would support bringing them down to zero or as close to zero as possible. 100%. 
on board. Okay, we're not making any motions, so you can talk. I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna, um, just because I'm just kind of of interest. Yeah, in this particular situation, since Kate is an owner of a business's license, she would need to abstain from the discussion. discussion of the vote. Yeah. Fair enough. Josh? 100% agree with you. Okay. Did, did we hear from everyone? Did we hear from Don? I'll assume we did. Yes, I, I agree yeah. to bring it down to zero. Okay, so we'll have an action item coming forward for, for the council on that item. Then. I'll, I'll let Linda know and she'll prepare it. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next item is the CARES Act funds update. Before, yes. I'm okay. sorry, before we do that, um, being that we're talking about meeting formats, the Planning Commission meeting on Tuesday. It's a Zoom meeting. It's a Zoom meeting. Is that our, okay. So yeah, I guess, never mind that we really don't have any need to come to City Hall for anything. All right. No, it's, it's published but, and I believe Haley did send out appointments to. Yes, yeah. 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 Uh, the CARES Act funds update. So as the council is aware, the CARES Act was passed by the feds allocated about $360,000 to the city for eligible expenses. Um, as the council knows, at our last council meeting, we approved submitting the certification to make us eligible to receive those funds. We're still waiting for them to come. We expect we'll receive them actually into our account in the next two weeks. Uh, currently, as staff, we're working through the process of identifying potential uses for those funds, help those eligible items we can be reimbursed for, and those expenses that we could make between, you know, between now and November 15th that would be eligible as well. Um, as we're working through that process, there's a couple of things that we are finding. One is we are continuing to build a list of potentially eligible items. We're also finding is that there's very little guidance on what is actually an eligible expense. There, if you recall, I kind of provided these very high level, broad guidance statements, like four bullet points that came down from the feds. Beyond that, there's absolutely zero definitive guidance, even though this has been out there for a month from the state um, on this issue. So for, just to give you one example, um, one of the items that you would think would be eligible would be first responder expenses related to the expense, but we nobody has received any sort of definitive response. Does that just apply to overtime that might have been related to it due to shift changes? Does that apply to just hours that they spent working on COVID response related items? Or does it potentially include just because of the nature of their jobs, their entire salary and benefits through the eligible time frame window? And as you can see, Depending on the answer to that, that has a massive impact on eligible expenses just on that one line item. And as we're working through our, our list of potential reimbursement and other expenses, um, we're continuing to ask questions and Mark's taking the lead on that. He's regularly participating on discussions and what we're finding is everybody has the exact same questions and there are no answers at this point. So at some point there will be, or we'll just be at a point where we'll have to use our best judgment and go forward and hope that it is eligible and that we don't have to pay the money back at some point. So if that's the case, we'll be very, very cautious on how we utilize the dollars. Some of the things that we are talking about currently is would be, of course, payroll um, reimbursement and future payroll through the eligible period for eligible payroll expenses, PPE. Um, we are looking at possible modifications to existing facilities to make them more COVID or contagion proof. Um, and we're in process of getting um, potential budget numbers for those types of items. Um, we're looking at uh, business assistance, um, grants or loans or forgivable loans, uh, but in that area as well. Just the items I listed now potentially exceed the dollars we have. So I expect we'll be coming back to the council. The council will have to make some priority decisions with regards to the use of the funds. My original intent was to, um, I saw that you raised your hand, Josh. Um, let me, I'll be finishing up here in a second. Um, we have had requests from our local, one of our local hospitals, that's an eligible, potential eligible expense to contribute dollars to them to help them recover costs from COVID as well. So the list is long. I was originally intending to come to the council on the August 13th meeting. Um, depending on the timing of when we get answers and the clarity of those answers, may, we may have to push that meeting. 
Um, but we're currently diligently working on that. We do plan on coming forward to the council with a list of potential options and recommendations uh, related to that. Josh, Mr. Mayor, Josh has hand raised. Josh, go ahead. Well, I don't want to steal any thunder joke because we might have our brains wrapped around the same thing. So I don't know if you want to talk about anything small business wise or anything. Otherwise, I will. Fire well, away. No, I mean, I think, and you, you hit on it, Tom, that, you know, you're looking at those different options. I want to not necessarily guarantee slash a hard in the, the, the ground draw line, but I mean, really, I mean, be um, dedicated to or uh, trying to make sure a portion of this, whatever that magic portion is, um, really gets pointed towards our small businesses in town uh, to get creative about that, whether that's 25% of the funds, 10%, I mean, just somehow making sure that, um, you know, and, and we can obviously decide the priorities of different things as, as we see that list uh, in the upcoming meetings, but um, I really think we need to look at the, the businesses that we have here in town and dedicate some portion of this to them um without hesitation even if that means we can't recoup some of it from the city level um but i don't know what that magic number or percent or breakdown would be i just feel really strongly about that gosh i had asked uh, for i had asked to be kind of kept in the loop on those conversations with uh as uh, Brenna and haley were working on it i suppose you're the eda chair I, would you want to also be included in those conversations? I'm sure it'll drive staff nuts, but we're fun. I don't necessarily need to be. Um, I trust uh, you're going to represent well, and now it's been on the record too where I sit. So um, I think direction has been provided. So I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? On that item, uh, the last item is the Governor's Executive Order 2081, the mask mandate. I just wanted to update the council on what impacts that has to the city, just our day-to-day -day operations and service delivery. Um, so I'll start with just day-to-day -day operations. Really what it's going to mean is some minor changes to how we're handling um, COVID protocols within the office and within the various departments. Um, within City Hall, it simply means that if you're outside of your cubicle or office area, in any common spaces, you're going to have to be wearing a mask unless you're in a room by yourself. Um, it means that if you're traveling anywhere in a vehicle with somebody else, you're going to need to wear a mask. Um, it means that if somebody comes into your office or is, if you're in a cubicle area within six feet of you, you'll have to wear your mask. Um, and then uh, I think that will mean, though, that we may quite honestly have some of our staff looking to work outside the office more than they have been. Um, recently because of the inconveniences associated with that. Uh, the other item for operations for public works, they generally work outside at distances greater than six feet, so that'll have a lesser impact, but the same general rules would apply if there are more than one person in the office space at the same time, they'll need to wear masks. If there's two of them in the vehicle, they'll need to wear masks. But if they're out on the field and they're maintaining more than six feet, they won't need to wear a mask, but if they are in closer proximity, um, they will. From a police department standpoint, there are some qualifiers or exemptions within the order that are specific to law enforcement. But generally speaking, um, the same rules would apply uh, if they're working uh, when they're traffic stops, they're not planning to wear masks, but they may be doing passenger side approaches, et cetera, to maintain that six foot of distance. They already have protocols when they get handed paperwork and licenses and things to disinfect after that, but the mask does create an issue for law enforcement, both from a clarity of direction and reading of facial features when they're interacting with the public, especially in law enforcement situation. But if they're going into somebody's house or something like that, or they're interacting with the public in close proximity, they would be wearing their masks as well. The other issue that impacts us that's related to this is the order places the burden on businesses to enforce the mask requirement and then places the burden if the person does not comply for them to call the police department and have the police department respond and deal with the issue. So I did want to give the council a quick update. Um, Chief and I have had discussions on how we would handle it both at City Hall and how the police department will be handling it generally. So the intent here is not to make an issue or create a point of confrontation. So if we have, a, we have an individual that comes into City Hall that is not wearing a mask, it will be posted that you do need to wear a mask at City Hall we will advise them 
of what the rule is, we will ask them to leave. And if they refuse to do so, we will service them as quickly as possible, advise them of the rule in the future. Now, if you have a repeat offender or somebody that's going to be an issue, that's a whole different situation. But our goal is not to have our staff become the mass police. Again, we'll advise, we'll request, and we'll service. Um, Brady will be going, the chief will be going around talking to local businesses that have storefronts and having similar conversations with them and basically recommending the same approach with regards to these issues. The order says that you have to make reasonable efforts for compliance as the business. It is our position that reasonable is that you have advised and you have requested. Now, if there's an individual that potentially exists wants to make an issue out of it and they do call law enforcement, law enforcement will use their normal opportunities. They will educate, they will request, they will persuade the last course of action would be any sort of citation and we're not intending to arrest people because they did not wear a mask but that's no different if you think about it than somebody who's in a place of business that's been asked to leave that doesn't leave and so they would approach it with that same type of approach which is get the person to leave resolve the issue quickly without confrontation don't make it a thing but there's always the potential something might happen so that's how we're approaching, um, we're going to be approaching it in the coming weeks as the um, executive order remains in place. Is there any questions about that? Okay. Um, public Works. And nothing. Nice. Fire Department, assuming there's nothing. No. Nope. Okay. Engineering. I have no report. I'll answer any questions you might have. Oh, I apologize. It's on the agenda. Um, I'll just give you a quick update on the progress of the home building after. Rich, Rich I'm sorry. We, I didn't hear you. <laughs> oh, all right. Thanks, Rich. The only thing it doesn't have Brady here to give us time to tonight. So you get this time to. <laughs> um, police department, uh, basically, they are finishing up the underground plumbing. They are planning to start pouring the floors as soon as early, as early as midweek next week. Um, with early the next week, if everything goes smoothly, to start framing in the non block walls within the interior. Um, we had a really good meeting today. Everything seems to be moving forward relatively smoothly. The greatest risks in a project are that are getting the, sh the shell and the plumbing and all the underground and utility work in. Once you get past that, it's fairly straightforward and actually should start picking up pace. Um, right now, the official schedule is that we would be substantially complete and ready for move-in the first week in November. But obviously, if things continue to move smoothly, there's the potential that it might be earlier than that. And that timeline will become clearer, of course, the further we get into the project. And I'll continue to send um, interim updates to the council. Do you think, I mean, since we're in this pandemic situation, I mean, I normally I would assume we would have some sort of open house for the police department when it's finally done. We could do some sort of like virtual tour or something. Can we do a ribbon cutting? We plan on probably doing all of those. Okay. Um, Brady, you know, I've already had discussions and this is, we haven't, we have an optimistic view of where the world will be next spring. But after they've fully moved in and settled into the space and the weather's nicer, it would be our intent to hold an open house for the facility similar to what we did with um, the water treatment facility and any other new facility that we open up. We've already had some loose conversations on that idea. We talked a little bit about the potential for a virtual tour to give people an idea of, of the facility, but very lightly at this point. And we definitely would be holding a ribbon cutting after they're in and um, fully settled. Okay, on uh, the community development. There are no specific updates. Okay, I didn't know if Renee's was on or anything, so. Parks, we got the, we got the draft of the minutes and I did see uh, Mark on. Not on the all right, well, let's... Mark had nothing specific you wanted me to relate to council. Okay. CCEC. Nothing. Unfortunately, I was 
I've been sick all week, so I did not go to the meeting two days ago. Uh, other committee and board reports, legislative policy committee updates. Has there been any meetings since our last one? I, last couple. Go ahead. No, oh, go, ahead. no go ahead, Amanda. Uh, this weekend I attended the Metro City's Municipal Revenue Policy Committee meeting, uh, which basically they just gave an overview of everything that is in that packet or you know, proposed. Um, I did just tonight send it to Tom to take a look at to see if there's things that I should focus in on more than others. Um, the other, the League of Minnesota City's Revenue Policy Committee was last week and I was not able to meet for that meeting. So those are the two that I'm participating in. Yeah, the two, I, I was able to attend two out of the three. Um, I can't remember what they're called, um, but mostly focused on economic development and housing stuff. As everybody probably knows, COVID was a big discussion in all of them, plus uh, uh, affordable housing, another hot topic, the Batsy stuff mm -hmm. and getting more aggressive uh, and uh, kind of beating them to the punch moving forward, so looking at policies or just legislative initiatives uh, regarding that. Um, yeah, and it's the first meeting, so it's the overview, selecting the speakers. We had MnDOT, we had DEED. We, I mean, we actually had a few speakers at them, so that was kind of good. Um, but I'll forward some of the stuff as things get kind of formulated. They did create a, a diversity and equity subgroup, subcommittee or whatever that I volunteered to be included in. Um, and then there was some talk or is uh, one of the task forces of one of the groups um, that I'm not on, um, but I weighed in on, of course. Um, they are moving forward with some language changes for potentially changing uh, remote meetings and allowing for more flexibility with that. So uh, I didn't uh, put our city's name as in support of that, but I said personally, uh, I would love to learn more. And now that they're moving forward with it, I'll shoot it over to Tom to send to you guys to see if we have an official stance on it. Yeah. Um, next is scale or is, uh, scale is canceled and or not scan just not scheduled for July, so no updates on my end for that or executive. I'm assuming the other two are just the same, right? Yeah, the we did hold the um, service delivery committee meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most of the discussion was really uh, circled around what people were going to be doing. Fair Cares Act funding and utilizing it. Um, all cities, to one degree or another, are carving out the portion for some sort of business subsidy eligible loan or grant program. Uh, there are variances, and cities are at varying points in that process from just getting going and deciding what the dollar amount is to already implementing them. So uh, we're not outside the curve, but we're probably in the latter half of that process relative to other cities. And to be blunt, it generally goes, the cities that are larger and had existing programs or have more staff are further down, further in the process than they are for sure. Um, other items just talking about potential eligible expenses, everybody's in the same boat. They're trying to identify what's eligible, um, what's the most beneficial use for those dollars um, for their organizations. And across the board, there's commitments to just basically share the list of this is what we're planning to use it on. So if anybody has a really good idea or a template that somebody else can use, they can be shared in typical scale of fashion. Okay. MVTA? Meeting is next week. I-35. Uh, meeting was a couple weeks ago. I already updated the last meeting. Okay. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, and I'm getting together with the Chamber President tomorrow morning, um, but I don't have any update. Kate, Mr. Chamber, nothing. Okay. On to discussion by council. I do have one item I'd like to talk about and just run it by everybody's uh, brains and see if we can bring it back up again. We've talked about it in the past, um, possibly going from an EDA to an EDC. I just kind of want to see how other people are thinking and feeling about changing our format, changing 
um, and, and making it more community driven. I'm a, it's going to shock you, Katie. I'm a big <laughs> fan of that. I've only been harping on it for years. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think we should. I, I don't know. I mean, we just did our vision and goals and planning stuff. Um, I don't know if there's a way to add that in there or to incorporate that in to what we're looking at for future work sessions and how that would look. Can you give the rookie a little background? So, okay, so the, right now our EDA, which, you know, I think we maybe have, have had one EDA meeting in the past, what, two years, something like that. I mean, that's what it feels like. Um, and our economic de development authority is all the same people that are on city council. Um, the reasons we haven't been having meetings or doing much is just lots of other things to do and we're kind of talking about some some of the typical stuff you may talk about in those meetings um, at council meetings. Um, an EDC is a little different whereas an EDA has authority has taxing authority. An EDC doesn't. Um, and it's really more of a recommendation body uh, to the city the city council. And I've always liked that idea because you're bringing in people from they're not necessarily directly involved in government. They, don't, they potentially don't have to even live within the city. They can even just work or have a business in the city. But you know, you talk to, and I'm just speaking with me, speaking personally. But you know, I'll talk to people from other cities or other EDC, EDC members at, in other places, and I've been part of an EDC in Lakeville, and you get a lot. You, you can get a lot of good ideas going. Um, that, I don't know, I think there's just a lot of benefit to having different people in the room um, that are not necessarily part of government, but just part of the peer business community um, that can help either raise issues for potential development or have or suggest different ideas. Maybe at the very mo at the very least, there are people that are well-known business people outside or, or are going outside and actively promoting the the market. So I've always been a big fan of it. Um, I know the and the reasons we haven't pursued that any further is just kind of a resource deal. Um, we have Haley and Renee, and I know it's they've uh, expressed concern about having the resources to be able to do that. Um, Tom, did you add anything? No, I do want to clarify the EDA you see a little bit. Go ahead. So an economic development authority has certain powers. Um, within statute to be able to levy issue debt and um, other authorities. We originally established the EDA simply to add tools to the toolbox. Um, and the intent was consciously not to add any other layer of bureaucracy so we could be nimble and responsive to economic development issues that would come up. So for example, we've got a big user at I-35 and we need to go through a process we don't need to go through an EDC or another organization, another level for being responsive to that. Um, and then the idea was that at the time, uh, we don't have the resources to support a whole other commission and it would still have to come to the council. So it was really, we're just adding tools to the toolbox. We're gonna to make it the council. We do want some feedback from the local business community. So we will appoint somebody that's recommended by the chamber to kind of provide that additional voice. So it was kind of the minimalist approach to how you do it. An EDC is an actual commission. Now, the council can assign EDA authorities to that EDC, or they can simply leave it as an advisory body. So what powers and authorities you give it and how it's structured um, are, are, are up to discussion and what the council would like to do. Now, from a staffing standpoint, that has been the ongoing issue. And so, issue, if you create a commission, you've got to resource it. Otherwise, you're wasting people's time and energy. And it's been staff's feedback consistently that we're stretched right now from a resource standpoint. We simply don't have the resources to staff a whole other commission. And because it's not just scheduling a meeting, but they're going to want to do things. And you know who does those things? It's staff. And so, 
it's a question of do we have the resources to do it. So it's a little bit of juice worth the, is the juice worth the squeeze, and do you even have the resources to do it? And so staff has been really conscious now. We'll do anything the council asks us to do. But if you ask us our opinion, our feedback has been that we're not resourced for it, and that the end result of that is going to be that the juice is worth the squeeze. Not the concept. That definitely has benefit. I have established, developed, and work with EDCs and other communities. But if we don't properly resource it, it's going to be ineffectual and it won't be a success. So that's been the limiting factor, primary limiting factor up to this point. So if this is something that, as a council, we decide we would want to do, I think it would be realistic to try and, I don't know. I mean, is there a way that we could just have it maybe on a work session one day where we can? Just brainstorm ideas that maybe, you know, if we do an EDC, the commissioner that's in charge, chairman of the EDC, actually puts together the agenda. Does no, I can tell you, I would be blunt and straight out, it will not function well okay. and will not be effective. You will need professional staff pulling it together. Otherwise, at that point, you're talking what it essentially becomes is the, and there won't be communications between staff. And that organization will simply become just the downtown business club or something like that from an effectiveness standpoint. If you're going to do it, you want to do it right, which means we're going to need additional resources, which we'd be happy to talk about. And, and, and that was where I was going. Yeah. You know, I, I looks, I'd love to start having, I know we did a while back have a conversation, but I'd love to revisit that conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I was not in Lake Billy, DC for a long time. I had to, Resign when I took office here, but you know a lot of the the people that were in that room were big business were were big hitters in the business community and brought perspectives that I wouldn't ordinarily have thought. Of. And it was a good learning tool. Um, you know, Lakeville. One example. I mean, Lakeville's done had a lot of construction projects going on. Uh, the EDC pushed really hard on. Uh, different ways of communicating and working with those businesses. And that's just, that, that's something that's just kind of been in my mind as we've had this roundabout project going on. And that's not to say staff hasn't done it. Oh, or have, staff hasn't tried to do it, but like you said, staff have just limited resources. Um, I don't know, I think it's good. And I, Kate brought it up and I'm doing all the talking here, but I would, be I, I would just like to revisit <laughs> it. I would like yeah. to talk logistically. I would love to know what the other council members think. I mean, I have, obviously, Joe is very passionate about it. I would like to, to revisit it and see if there's what we can do. Um, I think the input from other business um, owners or people in development, you know, would be great for another perspective, but I think we also have to talk about logistics and realistically if it's something that we can do or not and how the rest of the council feels. So, so I am all for it, you guys. So Kate and Joe, I agree with both you guys. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Amanda, if you were gonna start talking. I was gonna ask, how does the rest of the council feel? <laughs> so I mean it was great. I guess, I mean, it kind of goes back to the point Josh made in the work session, and then we need to start building out that staff and considering that the budget for 2021. Um, to, to properly resource. Yeah, right. to be able to properly resource and you know, do it the right way. Right. I don't know if it would be considered like when you're saying that you can assign EDA authority. Is that helpful? My recommendation, quite honestly, is I would not move any financial authorities to let you do anything away from the council. Yeah. I would keep it strictly an advisory body. Exactly. So yeah. just it would essentially be adding a third commission it that would advise. Yep. And I think that given the growth that we need to happen down here, having those outside bodies makes sense because we don't know everything. So it makes sense to me. So you're open to just at least kind of talking about just what we would have to do that. Josh, are you, you just vehemently opposed to all this? Well, I could be the pain in the butt, um, and it's fun to always do that. But I, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's it it is 
completely off the table unless we resource it um, 100%. I mean, and I think it, so it gets down to is, is it worth it? Um, and, and as we add a new person, I mean, we're already looking at 2022 before, uh, unless we, you know, do anything different with the budget to do anything. So, I mean, we have time to plan it out, time to think about it, but um, I, I don't know. I just. But Josh, are you open to having the conversation? Absolutely open to having the conversation. That's all I was really looking for. Yeah. All I wanted to do was be able to open up the conversation. So it, it's simple enough. We can just schedule um, a report item discussion on the future council agenda. We already have a memo on the topic that would just need to be revisited and updated. Um, to provide background on the topic for purposes of the council discussion. And if we're talking about um, future budget years, again, providing that background and having that discussion would inform a discussion when we're talking about projected budgets. So, perfect. And that's all I wanted, just to revisit it. I know we've talked about it in the past, but I... Kate, hey, thank you for bringing that up. You're but welcome, Mayor Joe. It's something I'm very, I am very passionate about. I think for that that discussion and that work session, just uh, and I can't remember what was in the previous memos or not, but uh, other cities, other other, just to get a, a glimpse of what it w could look like, where it's been successful, where it's flopped, um, uh, and just I'll tell you right now, I have a as one is going to tell you it's been highly successful. Cities don't like it and being solved on that. So I just I'm just telling you. <laughs> well, but, but maybe there's ways to define that more like. Mm -hmm. Where are some examples of this? I don't you can know. talk to we, some of the guys from the EDC. We may be able to get informal feedback that is maybe a more accurate um, assessment of it. But the big thing is quite honestly going to get a better understanding of what the resources are going to be. So yep. what are you doing with the resources you have allocated to it? I do know from personal experience that the upfront resources required for a commissioner dramatic. It's it's that initial investment of time and everything to get it up because you have to establish it. It can take six to eighteen months for your commission to develop an understanding of what their job really is and start to be able to get their arms around what they're doing and reach consensus. Because everybody has this big pile of ideas and have to whittle it down. It's just a process, mm -hmm. and that tends to be fairly resource intensive compared to what it is once it's up and running and it's an established commission and it kind of has a feeling of what its role is and really has its mission and its goals annually, then it becomes a little more efficient. And so we want to have this discussion with communities, if we can, on both of those, and get a better idea of what it might take for purposes of this discussion. So that would be an added dimension we had in the past, I think, that the council is looking for beyond just, here's what it is and do we want to do it? But maybe as part of that discussion, start having an idea of what the resources require, realistically, what the resources might be to make something like that. That'd be interesting. Yes. Yeah. Any other discussion by council? Anyone interested in adjourning? Motion to adjourn. A motion by Tillman. Second. The second by Novak. All vote. Aye. Panda. Aye. Josh. Aye. Dave. Aye. Don. Aye. All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.